Section 3 of The American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Engel. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 3. The Irish Setter by Max Wenzel, Secretary of the Irish Setter Club of America, and B. F. Seitner, Vice President the Pointer Club of America. Old writers have advanced the theory that our setter, as a species, is the product of the mating of a spaniel with the hound, and this seems to be as plausible as any other that has been offered. The bird-chasing instinct of the spaniel, mixed in the offspring with the love for fur which is inherent in the hound, may have had the effect at the earliest age, of an undecidedness in the presence of game. Being at first unable to decide whether, according to spaniel instinct, to bark and jump the game, or whether to be ruled by his hound ancestor and follow the foot scent, he may have stopped suddenly, thus establishing the first point on game. A genius of a sportsman, seeing the usefulness of such a quality, probably encouraged and perfected it by further training, giving us the long and the short-haired pointing bird dog. This theory may appear to some readers as lacking in the matter of authenticity, and yet to me it appears reasonable. All breeds of hounds and spaniels have no doubt been used in these numerous crosses, accounting for the great variety of our pointing dogs. But as regards the Irish setter, I am inclined to believe that the red spaniel, crossed on the old English bloodhound, has formed the parental stock. I have seen many red spaniels, have examined them closely as to color and coat. I have compared the characteristics of the bloodhound with the Irish setter, also in many individuals, and have plainly met the points of either one or the other in nearly every specimen so examined. Not to appearance alone need we confine ourselves in this investigation, for the bloodhound type is displayed not only in the overprominent occiput, the pendulous ears, the deep flues, but also in the voice and the carriage of the tail, and above all in the abominable style of so many Irish reds in the field, who follow scent with nose close to the ground, carrying their tails curved over their backs without any action at all. Many sportsmen of modern ideas condemn the red setter on account of these defects found in individuals, and there is a widespread prejudice that he is very headstrong, requiring breaking every season, and is unreliable on game. Yet few that have owned really good ones are willing to concede all this. Such assertions have their origin, not in practical trial of good specimens of the breed, but largely in the rehearsal of super-attenuated writings. If you will compare the oldest works on the dog with our modern writings, especially of English origin, you will find the same old story copied by one from another, credit seldom being given, and the whole breed suffers today from the criticisms, probably well-deserved, of some rank specimen that may have lived before the flood. This is not an uncommon occurrence in books on various subjects, more especially those treating of natural history, and we may often excuse the author, for he errs through ignorance. No breeder of any of our best strains of Irish setters will acknowledge that they are less tractable or more forgetful than other sporting dogs. Indeed, I know many that are perfect in disposition at home or afield, and while they are full of fire and are high-strung as a rule, if given the proper training, they will prove all right, and even more enduring than most other breeds of pointers or setters. The fact that many professional hunters use and prefer the red setter speaks volumes in favor of his high qualities and endurance. For the hardest kind of everyday work, during the whole season, we see many market shooters use the red dog, as the most reliable to work on partridge and woodcock, in cold or hot weather alike. Are not these men competent to select the dog that suits their purpose best? They certainly are, and many of them select the red Irish setter, for the reason that it takes the very best dog extant to bag the grouse and the woodcock in such numbers as to earn living wages for his master. For the English snipe, the red setter, as a rule, proves the toughest, fastest, and keenest-nosed setter, and he is reliable, in all weather and under all conditions, on this as on other game. 
Can any modern pointer or silk and velvet English setter do this work as well as the Irish red? Let them try the snipe on a raw, windy March day, up to their hocks in slush and icy water. Will they, especially the pointer, not rather go around the ditches than through them? Have you ever seen the English setter or pointer shiver from head to foot while at such work? These breeds are good in their places, but the red Irish is good under all conditions. In connection with the claims made here for this breed, I regret to say that working a red Irish on game and keeping the same dog for bench show purposes is generally out of the question, as work in the field unfits this breed almost absolutely to compete with those specimens that are kept and pampered for the bench alone, where a rich, dark, glossy coat seems to be valued above any and every other quality. So we must either keep one kind or the other, the dude or the workman. Having exhibited Irish setters every year since 1876 at most of our shows, and having been fairly successful as a breeder, I should be content with my lot. Yet the more I see, the more convinced am I that the improvements we look for in our favorite breed will not be realized through bench shows, because the average fancier will be guided by the awards of the bench show judge, and that which should be his object, namely the raising of good field dogs, will be lost sight of unless he can prove by indisputable evidence that the prize dog is also backed by a field record for speed, style, and above all, nose. Through the bench shows, it has also become fashionable to suppress the white in this breed, and nowadays many sportsmen know little or nothing of this noble breed other than the fact that there must be no white on him. And it has gone so far that a dog, be he ever so good, that has a white spot, would neither be saleable, nor would he be ever noticed at a show. You may rest assured that those who judge a red setter in that manner have not gone any further than the ABC of the matter. I refer all such to the English stud book, wherein it is shown that the white is perfectly legitimate, and that it may be found in every good strain for many generations. It is so, has been so always, and will be so forever, Indeed, it is, in my judgment, a proof of purity of blood rather than anything else, for less white is found in strains known to have the Gordon blood than in the absolutely pure. Besides, the English and our American standards admit the presence of white on chest or toes and a blaze or strip in forehead. The fashion, however, overrules in this, as in many other things, good common sense, and I see that some of our enterprising breeders are regulating their prices on this basis. Are we progressing? Not unless we make it our first aim, in breeding, to reach that degree of perfection which we find in the modern English setter and the high-class pointer of today in their field work. In order to attain these ends, I see no better way than the rule followed by old-time sportsmen, to always select the best working specimens, those possessed of high speed, grand style and perfect nose, and mate them with others as good, or if possible, still better. Pay less attention to breeding on paper and to the pedigree theory. Never mind the show condition and the dark color unless we find these all in the one specimen, but remember what has been said before on this subject. That one mating of two good specimens will do all you desire cannot be expected. I have frequently noticed that the sire will transmit his good qualities to the bitch puppies, and they again will reproduce them in their male offspring, oftener than directly to their own sons. Whatever quality is bred for must be constantly looked to for several generations. This is the only sure way to get uniform results. Inbreeding, to some extent, is not harmful. Indeed, it is the only reliable course, if practiced within proper limits, with well-selected individuals, as the breeding of all domestic animals has abundantly proven. It will take but a few years of such breeding to produce puppies that will go afield at almost any age and instinctively hunt and chase birds. They will be full of point and style and will require less than half the breaking our dogs now require. I have always made my youngsters mind me and am assisted by the example of the older dogs. I have them come to me when called, teach them to charge anywhere, and soon have them under full control. All this can be done by kindness and while some professional handlers use and advocate force, I believe the less of it that is used, the better the dog will be. 
An expert handler once told me that the first thing he does with an Irish setter puppy, when he takes it in hand, is to give it a sound thrashing. It is needless to say that he will never be entrusted with a puppy of mine. Most Irish Reds are of a kind, affectionate disposition and are easily trained. Despite their reputation, I have found this so, year in and year out in my own kennel, and I have had many that have taken to game as naturally as to walking. A long time ago I owned a fine young bitch and wanted her trained. She was sent to a market hunter in Sullivan County, New York. Three months later I went there to see my dog on game. She was taken out, reluctantly, by the trainer, who must have been the more surprised of the two of us, for she pointed both partridges and quails in good style and without command, made use of the retrieving she'd been taught by me, in spite of, as I subsequently learned, the fact that she had never been off her chain since I sent her to him. I was satisfied, of course, and to this day I have not had a better nosed nor a stauncher dog. I have hunted her for years, to my entire satisfaction. She is living now and is nearly fourteen years old. Another illustration is my old champion chief. He has always been the same steady, reliable, everyday dog. First or last in the season, he would point his birds staunchly and needed no repeated breakings. The first one has lasted him so far very well, and while old in years, he still looks fine and is in perfect health, confirming my experience that setters of this breed, while maturing later, outlast most of the dogs of other breeds. A letter received recently from South Carolina confirms this still further, as Dr. Jarvis writes me that his champion Elko, Jr., though nine years old, hunts day in and day out and does most excellent work for him. My experience with this breed dates back nearly 20 years, and I feel able to guarantee this disposition of our strain of dogs, and to state that in all this time I have never owned a vicious one. I have seldom seen one that would not make an excellent playmate for a child, yet I have had many that were most perfect watchdogs, and that showed more than human intelligence in discriminating between proper and improper sounds and doings at night, without special training to it. The management of my kennel is the most simple. I have no kennel buildings except a rough board box for each dog, with a wire runner in summer, and stall and barn for winter where I place these kennels. If one becomes infested with vermin, it is burned. The dogs are exercised twice a day for half an hour, where they have access to the spring brooks, are fed once a day in summer and twice in winter. We boil beef and bones and soak half a loaf of toasted stale bread for each dog varying this now and then with corn and oatmeal mush cooked in beef broth, and they relish it all. When I have a sick dog, I try to find out what his trouble is and then treat him accordingly, and am very particular with young dogs showing symptoms of distemper, which must be most carefully diagnosed. There is no such thing as a distemper cure that will fit all cases. Each case requires special treatment, and hundreds of young dogs, I am sure, are killed by distemper cures alone as well as by the man who never lost a dog with distemper. The man who prescribes a lump of sulfur to be put into the patient's drinking water is as innocent as his remedy. The man who physics your dog when he has the typhoid form of the complaint, as well as he who insists on putting a seton through your puppy's neck after he is already too weak to stand on his legs, should never be employed in any case. These heroic remedies are freely recommended by many members of the Fraternity of Vets, especially of the old school. To use the proper medicines in the very beginning is the most important, no doubt, and when I notice a puppy's stools come of a gray clay color, calomel in five to six grain doses has always the desired effect of regulating the bowels. The patient should have special care, warm quarters, should be kept quiet, should be fed better than usual, but a less quantity. And in case of failing appetite, you should use first some quinine, especially if the patient be feverish, and sometimes, in very high fever, tincture of aconite, in one or two drop doses, as well as five to ten drops of Fowler's solution of arsenic for a short time, as an alternative. Yet, with all due care and attempts at halfway scientific treatment, I must admit that there is a good deal of Dutch luck in pulling a puppy through a bad case of distemper and having him prove sound afterward. In cases where the puppy is not permanently cured, he would be better dead than to suffer for years, or for life, with chorea. 
It is an act of mercy to chloroform him. I am not so sanguine in regard to curing distemper as I was ten years ago. For breaking young dogs for the field, I usually engage the services of a specialist in that line. My youngsters are rarely handled before they are a year old and over distemper, when they are sent south with a professional trainer. Below, the standard of the Irish Setter Club of America is given. It does not suit us all, but when it was adopted, all questions were fully discussed, and the points varying from the English standard are those in which our American dogs required improvement. Standard and Points of Judging the Red Irish Setter Adopted by the Irish Setter Club of the United States, July 1886 Head, 10 Eyes, 5 Ears, 5 Neck, 5 Body, 15 Shoulders, four legs and feet, 12 Hind legs, 10 Tail, 8 Coat and feather, 8 Color, 8 Size, style, and general appearance, 14 Total, 100 Head should be long and lean, the skull oval from ear to ear having plenty of brain room and with well-defined occipital protuberance. Brows raised, showing stop. The muzzle moderately deep and fairly square at end. From the stop to the point of the nose should be long, the nostrils wide, and the jaws of nearly equal length. Flues not to be pendulous. The color of the nose, dark mahogany or dark chocolate, and that of the eyes, which ought not to be too large, rich hazel or brown. The ears to be of moderate size, fine in texture, set on low, well back, and hanging in a neat fold close to the head. Neck should be moderately long, very muscular, but not too thick, slightly arched, free from all tendency to throatiness. Body should be proportionately long, shoulders fine at the points, deep, and sloping well back. The chest deep, rather narrow in front. The ribs well sprung, leaving plenty of lung room. The loins muscular and slightly arched. The hind quarters wide and powerful. Legs and feet. The hind legs from hip to hock should be long and muscular, from hock to heel short and strong. The stifle and hock joints well bent, and not inclined either in or out. The forelegs should be strong and sinewy, having plenty of bone with elbows free, well let down, and like the hock, not inclined either out or in. The feet rather small, very firm, toes strong, close together, and arched. Tail should be of moderate length, set on rather low, strong at root, and tapering to a fine point, to be carried in a slight scimitar-like curve or straight, nearly level with the back. Coat. On the head, front of legs, and tips of ears should be short and fine, but on all other parts of the body it should be of moderate length, flat, and as free as possible from curl or wave. Feathering. The feather on the upper portion of the ears should be long and silky. On the back of fore and hind legs, long and fine. A fair amount of hair on the belly, forming a nice fringe, which may extend on chest and throat. Feet to be well feathered between the toes. Tail to have a nice fringe of moderately long hair, decreasing in length as it approaches the point. All feathering to be as straight and as flat as possible. Color and markings. The color should be rich, golden chestnut or mahogany red, with no trace whatever of black. White on chest, throat, or toes, or a small star on the forehead, or a narrow streak or blaze on the nose or face, not to disqualify. Notes on our dogs. In head, we have not enough uniformity, some dogs showing the long, narrow head, without the proper stop at the eyebrow giving the face an indescribably brainless expression. While others have the wide and round skull, entirely at variance with the standard. The color of eye seems to be a matter of strain, some specimens having the beautiful dark brown eye, while others are of a hazel or even a dark oak shade. These are minor points, and I consider none but the gooseberry eye seriously objectionable. The ears are often badly set, folding back and outward and in this case generally too short. Again, many are hound-like, thick, and too long, relative of the bloodhound. 
Rarely do we find a perfect neck in our present red setter, and in most specimens it is too short and thick, the head resting almost on the shoulder blades. We must improve in this point. In body, legs, and feet, our setters are, as a class, I believe, more perfect than most other breeds of dogs, having a deep chest, strong loin, more arched than the English setter, and a good development of muscle in the limbs. Demerits in these parts we must carefully weed out in breeding, and we have a long way yet to go to reach perfection. The red setter is supposed to be higher on the leg than either the English or black and tan, and I think it rather an advantage to leave him so for the best development of speed. Yet I am not favoring a big dog, for we want no lumber, but a good upstanding setter with perfect slope shoulder, well-bent stifle, and the longer the bone between stifle and hock, the better for speed. In raising the scale of points for a good tail, we seem to have laid the stumbling block of our present standard, for it does not suit the bad ones. This change has been made deliberately, and the committee in charge is willing to stand or fall thereby. We point to some of our best specimens of the breed to illustrate the necessity of it. At most of our bench shows, we find specimens with tails carried either hound-like over the back, or worse still, hanging Newfoundland fashion, with a great big hook carried between the legs. Is not the stern of any bird dog the very soul of his style? and it is this very style we need so much more of in our red dogs. Is it possible to call the carriage of a calf a point? I have seen Irish setters that none but their owner could tell when they were pointing. We must make sweeping reforms in this respect through careful breeding, for it is this very lack of style that condemns the red dog at our field trials, and with perfect justice. A lack of style may do for the pot hunter and novice, but to the true sportsman and breeder, it is an abomination. We can only improve by knowing where to do it and by acknowledging our defects. In color, we are ahead of any breed of dog on this globe, for the rich dark mahogany and golden chestnut coat of our favorites is beauty itself, and it shows the superiority and purity of breeding over that of any other sporting dog known. Because the Irish red is red, plenty of it in every time, no matter how you breed them. You may get some very green ones, but they will look red nevertheless. I have had no little fun with a friend, a lover of the English setter, who is a great admirer of the blue-ticked color, and the owner of as grand a field dog as ever lived of this color. He wishes to raise some blue-ticked stock, and to do so has bred his bitch to about all the celebrities of the breed, yet his ardent hopes are not yet gratified, and his bitch throws any color of pups, from green-white, all black, lemon and white, orange, red and white, and what he calls blue, but not the blue he's after. I advised him to try the red cross, but he is down on any other color than the one he can't get. I am digressing from the subject, yet this incident serves to show the difference in the reliability of the two breeds, to the advantage of the Irishman. We find two shades of red in this breed, the darker and the light, the modern fashion favoring the former, the presence of white has already been spoken of. It is no fault or blemish. In coat texture, we also find a variety, both, no doubt, being all right, and a peculiarity of the strain. The one, short on body, rather harsh, is frequently the darker, while the light shade is longer, spaniel-like, having a sort of undercoat. And this seems to me the more useful one for the purpose, giving the better protection from wet and cold. It is this kind that is so apt to become wavy when exposed to the hardships of the field, the very thing that handicaps them at the shows, which, in this breed, more than in any other of the sporting breeds, have actually been detrimental to the breed, in placing before any other quality that beauty of color and gloss of coat of the mahogany red. In speaking in this manner of bench shows, I do not mean to condemn these institutions, for they are useful, and to the owners and trainers very entertaining, if to the dogs a torture. They are a sort of necessary evil. No event of the year equals in interest one of our larger shows, where all the men interested in dogs seem to gather for a sort of love fest. An extreme good fellowship usually prevails, especially among those who are favored by the blue, while the disappointed ones each find some grand, good quality in his dog somewhere, which the judge had overlooked, but which they are bound all shall recognize with them. 
Animosity is wiped out, and new friendships are sealed around the corner if it takes all day and a few hours of the next day. East and west, north and south, all are happy alike. The St. Bernard man was never known to leave his row, while the bulldog man looks with utter contempt at any breed that can't fight. The pointer man blows a bit more than the rest, and the English setter man feels above them all. The Irish lad is found at the front sometimes, and tries to hold his own, while the rest all talk together at once. For my part, I would not miss the New York show if I had to walk a hundred miles to see it, but am as much of a mystery to myself when it is over as if I had never seen it, for I, too, never see anything there but the Red Setter, and the boys, old and young, and find myself more fascinated there than when I took my first premium at the Philadelphia Centennial Show with an Irish Red. What changes in the Irish Setter and their owners since then? I really think I am the oldest exhibitioner of these dogs, and almost the only one still interested in the breed of all those who used to show them at that time. I've seen all the celebrities of the bench, Rufus, Elko, Rory O'More, Rose, Flora, Noreen, Plunkett, Berkeley, Glencoe, Lady Clare, Trix, Hazel, etc., besides all the many fine ones that never got there up to the present day. Speaking of the champions then and now, I fail to see a very great improvement in the dogs. In the bitches we are going backward, while in our present open show classes the average is very much improved over those of ten years ago, with prospects for improvement still further. A few years ago, the Irish Setter Club was formed, a good start made for a field trial at Salisbury, North Carolina, with 22 entries. It snowed on the night before the start. It proved a hard blow to the Irish Setter, for nearly all of us got discouraged. At the last New York, 1890, show, some of the old hands rallied, young blood was stirred in, and we now hope for a brighter future, and ask all lovers of the breed to join that club, whose aim will be to make as good a field dog of the Irish Red as he is handsome. And now that you have finished reading this, you may as well send your application for membership to the secretary of the Irish Setter Club. Max Wenzel, Hoboken, New Jersey. The origin of the Irish Setter, like that of his cousins, the English and the Gordon Setter, is buried in obscurity, and no additional light is likely to illuminate the past for the inquiring mind. Careful research and extensive inquiry among the breeders and fanciers of the Irish Setter in England and Ireland have failed to elicit any new facts concerning the origins and development of this breed. It has been suggested that he is a descendant of the liver-colored setting dog. As a matter of fact, says Vero Shaw, the earliest mention that we have been able to discover of any setter peculiar to Ireland is in the sportsman's cabinet, where, in the chapter on English setters, direct allusion is made to this breed of dogs in the following words— the sporting gentlemen of Ireland are more partial to setters than to pointers, and they are probably better adapted to that country. This seems to indicate that setters, of some kind, were used on the Emerald Isle at the beginning of this century. It must always be a matter of regret that nothing was said by the writer in question, or by other chroniclers of his time, of the appearance of these dogs. However, coming down to the time when the red dog first began to attract attention in England— his admirers were divided on the color line, some breeders claiming that red without any admixture of white was the proper color, while others, with equal fervor, insisted that the red dog with white points was just as proper and pure an Irish setter as the all-red dog. There could be no doubt that both are descended from the same parent stock and have in later years been interbred, so that it is no uncommon occurrence to see, in a litter of Irish setter puppies, several with white markings on face, breast, and feet. In the subjoined letter, just received from Rev. Robert O'Callaghan, the most successful breeder of Irish setters in England, and probably the best living authority on this breed in the world, conclusions similar to my own are accurately and fully set forth as to the origin of the breed and the development of the color. Quote, Bostel House, Rochester, England. To B. F. Seitner, Dayton, Ohio, USA. Dear Sir, in reply to your request for some notes as to the origin and development of the Irish Setter, I do not find anything like reliable information on this subject earlier than the present century. 
I have no hesitation in stating my belief that the Irish setter is the oldest breed we possess, as well as the purest. But if, as is generally allowed, the history of all setters be obscure and difficult to trace, how much more so the history of the Irish? The reasons are obvious, but I will not enter into this question, and will only say that after careful and diligent study of the subject, I feel compelled to give my adhesion to the now generally received opinion that all setters are descended from the Spaniel. We have it recorded in the Sportsman's Repository, 1820, that setters in Ireland used to be called setting spaniels. Now it is difficult to explain how our modern setters were produced. I believe, with Darwin, in nature giving us successive variations, and man adding up these variations in a certain direction useful to himself, and thus making for himself useful breeds. If, then, we want a special quality in any animal, we have only to watch carefully and breed sufficiently, and the required variety is sure to be produced and can be increased to any extent. Wallace says, Instinct, speed, form, and color have always varied so as to produce the very races which the world or fancies of men led them to desire. In a word, he looks upon natural or artificial selection as the simple basis for indefinite modification of the forms of life. With the opinion of two such authorities before us, as well as our own experience of what can and what has been done in the way of breeding, I do not think there need be much doubt as to the origin of the setter. The Irish have always been a sporting race, and no doubt they paid great attention to their setting spaniels. Being required for hard work, they would select the animal best suited for that purpose, and the breeding of successive generations of animals capable of hunting the wet bogs and mountains of Ireland has resulted in building up a race which may be equaled, but certainly cannot be excelled by any sporting dog in the world. And so carefully and jealously were they preserved, and so highly were they prized, that we were told by a writer, I. Scott, in the Sportsman's Cabinet of 1823, of the renewal of a lease given for a dog and bitch, which lease, if allowed to expire, would have cleared for the landlord two hundred fifty pounds per annum. As to their color, the same writer tells us that it was all red or deep chestnut and white. No doubt this all red was obtained by careful selection, with an evident purpose to subserve a useful end by Irish sportsmen, and that long before the days of firearms this exquisitely deep chestnut, so characteristic of the breed, may have been, and no doubt was, suggested to our rude forefathers by the color of the red deer of their native hills and forests a color which harmonized so well with the hues of the decaying bracken and the purple heather as to aid in concealing him from his enemies. However this may be, the very dark red of the Irish setter would have the advantage of enabling him to approach closer to his game, in fact would make him almost invisible, and so all the more capable of serving his master's ends. And if this be an advantage in the present day, as it undoubtedly is, how much greater must have been the advantage in the days of our sturdy sires, whose rude weapons necessitated a closer approach to their game. A well-known writer of our day recognizes the advantage of protective colors in the sportsman's dress, and advises him, when he expects the birds to be wild, to adopt garments of a somber hue, avoiding conspicuous colors. Stonehenge says, Because of the wariness of the grouse, the color of the clothes should be attended to. He recommends the heather pattern, from its resemblance to the general covert of the birds. Under all these circumstances, I think we can have no difficulty in tracing the origin and distinctive color of the Irish red setter. Many Irish families were celebrated for rare strains of the breed, among them the O'Connor, or La Touche, the Dufresne, or French Park, the Lord Dillons, Waterford, and Lismore, the latter the head of the O'Callaghan family. But where are all these kennels now? Echo answers, where? Owing to the ruinous prodigality and thriftless extravagance of the Irish squires of the past century, as well as the successive convulsions which have rent unhappy Ireland, its noble race of setters has been scattered to the winds, neglected and uncared for, and at this moment I know of no kennel of the pure race in the country. Shows have done little, if anything, to improve the breed. The quantity has increased, but not the quality. 
The true type is lost sight of because the breed is not kept up by the practical sportsmen or even by men who can lay the slightest claim to a correct knowledge of the breed, but by those whose only aim is to make money. The consequence of this is that our shows are full of snippy, weedy mongrels, which, save in color, and that only sometimes, are as unlike the wiry, racy, blood-bred Irishmen as they well can be. It is to this fact, too, that we must attribute the bad name given to Irish setters as being headstrong and difficult to train. How can it be otherwise? Show animals, bred anyhow, and from untrained parents are foisted on the public. If the setting instinct be undeveloped from generation to generation, reversion to type will be the consequence, and in each successive generation it will become beautifully less. I notice in America the same state of things goes on. While large sums of money are expended in purchasing the best types of English setters from the best breeders, Irish setters, so-called, are purchased haphazard from what I call mushroom breeders because they are cheap. And thus a race of setters is perpetuated which are a libel on the breed, and so widely different from the true type as the north is from the south. What else can one expect from promiscuous and injudicious crossing? How is this state of things to be remedied? Only by careful and scientific breeding. Any remnants of old families, carefully and judiciously bred to, would, beyond a doubt, bring back the family type and characteristics. I claim to speak with authority on this subject, as I have bred, broken, and shot over them for a space of forty years. In fact, I was born and brought up with them. They have been the playmates and companions of my children, and are part and parcel of my family. The first of my dogs was exhibited in 1868, when Grouse, brother to Plunkett, was successful on the bench. Plunkett's success as a field trial winner is well known, his brother Rover was chosen by Stonehenge to represent the true type of an Irish setter, and my grouse too, winner of the 15-guinea Challenge Cup Dublin 1879, was chosen to represent the breed in the Book of the Dog by Vero Shaw. Absence from England and the service of my country prevented me from doing more than carefully preserving my stock, but since my return home my success on the show bench has been unbroken. As to success in the field, I am to a large extent handicapped as I have no trainer of my own, and have to depend entirely upon trainers who either have their own interests to serve, to which mine are secondary, or else they are quite incompetent. Even under circumstances such as these, however, I undoubtedly put the best setter, I may say indeed the best as well as the handsomest sporting dog, in the field in 1885, Aveline, and, I say it advisedly, she was not allowed to win first in that contest. Aveline met and defeated three of the Llewellyn setters, and her final heat was decided in three and a half minutes. Aveline, now a champion, is a daughter of Frisco and Grouse too. And as you have asked me as to the most successful crosses, I have no hesitation in saying that I have found the Elko blood, crossed on the Palmerston, to be the most successful, both in field and on bench. I say pure Palmerston, because it has come to my knowledge that Palmerston is credited with having served more bitches than he ever did, or in fact could have served. This is why Frisco, grandson to Elko, has not been successful as a sire with mongrel bitches, while matched with a pure Palmerston. The produce is all that can be desired. I possess at this moment two sons of Frisco and Grouse II, Shandon II and Fingal II, and the daughter Aveline. All are bench winners at the largest shows, as well as grand in the field, and one has but to see them to feel at once that he looks on thoroughbreds of their species. Desmond, too, belonging to Mr. C.T. Thompson of Philadelphia, bred by me, and winner of field trials at Philadelphia, is of precisely the same blood. This same cross it is that has produced so many bench and field trial winners for Claremont, Dr. Jarvis of New Hampshire. I have still living, and quite good for stud purposes, my champion Ganymede. He is the sire of champion Tyrone, Kildare, and Geraldine, besides many others, and the best type of Irish setter now living, to my mind. Geraldine, too, is granddaughter to Ganymede and Frisco. I fear I have already written too much anent my favorites, but I am sure under the circumstances you will excuse me. Robert O'Callaghan End quote 
Both Stonehenge and Vero Shaw record the following as the most noteworthy of the old strains from which the present race of Irish setters is descended. Among valuable strains of the Irish setter are the O'Connor, better known as Latouche, made famous through Champion Palmerston, Lord Dillon's, Lord Lafrain's, also called the French Park breed, Lord Lismore's, Lord Clancarty's, the Mount Hedges, Lord Rossmore's, and the Marquis of Waterford's. In modern days, Dr. Stone, Major Hutchinson, Captain Cooper, Captain French, H.B. Knox, the Honorable D. Plunkett, Captain Alloway, Mr. Hilliard, Mr. Lipscomb, Mr. O'Brien, and Miss Warburton, and I must include last, although by no means least, Reverend Robert O'Callaghan. All have won bench show honors with their dogs, but only Mr. Plunkett and later Reverend O'Callaghan have won field trial honors with their strains. Mr. Plunkett, by the way, won with a dog, Plunkett, bred by the Reverend O'Callaghan. The high quality of the latter gentleman's dogs was recognized in the most emphatic manner by the highest authorities in the canine world. Stonehenge chose as a subject for illustrating his article on the Irish setter, in his book Dogs of the British Isles, 4th edition, Rover, a prize winner and brother to the well-known field trial winner Plunkett, and Vero Shaw chose from the same kennel as an illustration for his Book of the Dog, Grouse II, these being the most typical specimens of the breed in their day. When the Irish setter first became popular in England and America, rapid progress was made in the improvement of the breed, and such grand dogs as Reverend O'Callaghan's Grouse, his great brother, the field champion winner Plunkett, Champion Palmerston, Rufus, the celebrated Elko, and Thornstein, delighted the public and became pillars of the stud book. In the history of the introduction and development of the Irish setter in America, an interesting study is presented to the breeder and sportsman, and to such gentlemen as the late Arnold Burgess, Mr. E. F. Stoddard of Dayton, Ohio, Dr. William Jarvis of Claremont, New Hampshire, Charles Turner of St. Louis, and others whose liberality and wisdom placed the best Irish setter blood in the world within their reach, the American sportsmen are under lasting obligations. The place of honor as the foremost American breeder of this grand strain of dog justly belongs to Dr. Jarvis. He it was who, by breeding Rose to Elko, discovered the wonderful affinity of the Elko for the Palmerston blood. His career, however, as a breeder began before Elko had been heard of, for in 1873 he brought out a dog popularly known as Jarvis's Dick, whose portrait was published in The Old American Sportsman and Forest and Stream. He was of unknown parentage. His sire and dam, it is said, were imported, but beyond that nothing was known of them. He won the Silver Cup for Best Irish Setter at the Rod and Gun Club Show at Springfield, Massachusetts. Dr. Jarvis then imported from the kennels of Mr. Llewellyn, a bitch called Kitty, a daughter of the famous field trial winner Plunkett. In the fall of 1875, he imported from Ireland the bitch Kathleen, a granddaughter of Hutchinson's well-known Bob. About this time, also, Dr. M. Goldsmith of Rutland, Vermont, imported the famous dog Champion Plunkett, Arnold Burgess, his Rufus, and Mr. E. F. Stoddard, friend. In August of this year, friend whelped a litter to Rufus, several of which the following year made their mark at the Centennial Show. They were Rufus II and Firefly. The St. Louis Kennel Club, or Mr. Charles Turner of that organization, imported and brought out Champion Lou II, Aaron, Elko, Berkeley, and others. Mr. Stoddard, in 1876, imported Champion Duck and Bob. In the spring of 1877, Dr. Jarvis purchased from Mr. Turner of the St. Louis Kennel Club, Elko, and thereby secured for his kennel the best Irish setter dog in the country. In the fall of the same year, he imported from the kennels of Mr. Cecil Moore the now-famous bitch Rose, the beautiful daughter of the great Palmerston out of Flora. Rose was the first of the Palmerston blood brought to America, and her record stands today unrivaled by that of any other setter bitch. Rose, bred to Elko, produced in her first litter the well-known Lady Clare, the field trial and show winners Rally and Laura. Lee Doan, Little Nell, Yub, Champion Norwood, and Elko III are also among the descendants of this famous pair. Dr. Jarvis next imported, from the kennels of Mr. J. J. Giltrip, Noreen, 
a daughter of Gary Owen, a noted prize winner. She, too, was bred to Elko. Great as had been the doctor's success with Rose and her progeny, he not only equaled, but fairly eclipsed it with Noreen, for she produced four champions in one litter, one of the four, Bruce, a field trial winner, Glencoe, Noreen II, and Elko Jr. Here are four dogs that have individually and collectively won more prizes and have produced and got a larger number of winners than any other equal number of setters in America. Elko Jr. is unquestionably the best representative of his race ever seen in this country. Next to these justly ranks Stoddard's friend. Mr. Stoddard's memory will always be cherished by the lovers of the Irish setter for his intelligent and successful efforts in developing the breed, and compelling public admiration and recognition of his merits. Friend herself was a grand bitch in the field. While not as fast as some others I have seen, she yet proved good enough to win first prize at the Minnesota Field Trials of 1878 in a field of 13 starters. The Chicago Field's report of that event states that Friend ran out her score without making a single error. Bred to Rufus, she produced the centennial winner Rufus II, Firefly, champion Rory O'More, and others. Mr. Stoddard also bred some good ones from Champion Duck by his Bob. He was also the breeder of that grand, young, and now well-known dog, Mac N., owned by Mr. W. N. Coons of Dayton, Ohio. There are other breeders that deserve mention. Foremost among these are Mr. Max Wenzel of Hoboken, New Jersey, owner of the noted field trial and bench show winner Champion Chief, by Berkeley out of Duck, and Tim, also a prize winner, by the field trial winner Biz, out of Hazel, a daughter of Elko, out of Rose. Mr. W. N. Callender of Albany, New York, who exhibited Rory O'More at the New York Show, 1877, has bred a number of good ones, and Mr. Charles T. Thompson of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the present owner of Desmond II, blood brother to Reverend O'Callaghan's Shandon II and Fingal II, and the field trial winner, Aveline, by Frisco, out of Grouse II, has kept well to the front with his dogs. Elko Jr. is one of the most noted dogs of his race. In him, almost the extreme limit of refinement has been reached, and breeders can scarcely hope to excel him in finish. His almost perfect harmony of proportions may hardly be surpassed. His service should be sought by those having Irish setter bitches of the large, heavy-boned, or short cobby sort. His winnings are as follows. First, Puppy Class, Boston, 1882. First, Open Class, Ottawa, 1883. First, Open Class, New Haven, 1885. First, Champion Class, New York, 1884. First, Champion Class, Montreal, 1884. First, Champion Class, New York, 1885. First, Champion Class, Cincinnati, 1885. First, Champion Class, Spring, Philadelphia, 1885. First, Champion Class, South Attleboro, 1885. First, Champion Class, Boston, 1886. First, Champion Class, Hartford, 1886. First, Champion Class, Cleveland, 1886. First, Champion Class, New York, 1886. First, Champion Class, St. Louis, 1886. First, Champion Class, Boston, 1887. First, Champion Class, Pittsburgh, 1887. First, Champion Class, New York, 1887. First, Champion Class, Detroit, 1887. First, Champion Class, Syracuse, 1888. First, Challenge Class, New York, 1889. First, Challenge Class, Troy, 1889. Champion, Irish Setter, Sweepstakes of America and Cup. And Special for Best Irish Setter, New York, 1884. Special for Best Setter Dog, Any Breed, Montreal, 1884. Special for Best Irish Setter, New York, 1885. Special for Best Irish Setter, Spring, Philadelphia, 1885. Special for Best Setter Dog, Any Breed, South Attleboro, 1885. Special for Best Irish Setter Dog, Boston, 1886. Special for Best Irish Setter Dog and Special for Best Irish Setter Dog or Bitch, Hartford, 1886. Special for Best Irish Setter, Cleveland, 1886.
Special for Best Irish Setter, Special for Best Irish Setter Dog, and Special for Best Setter Dog or Bitch Any Breed, New York, 1886. Special for Best Irish Setter Dog and Special for Best Irish Setter Dog or Bitch, St. Louis, 1886. Special for Best Irish Setter and Special for Best Irish Setter Dog or Bitch, Boston, 1887. Special for Best Irish Setter and Special for Best Irish Setter Dog, Pittsburgh, 1887. Special for Best Champion Irish Setter Dog, Special for Best Irish Setter Dog and Special for Best Irish Setter Dog or Bitch, Detroit, 1887. Special for Best Irish Setter Dog, Syracuse, 1888. Special for Best Irish Setter Dog, Troy, 1889. Special with Lorna for Best Pair of Irish Setters, New Haven, 1885. Special with Lorna for Best Pair of Irish Setters, Cleveland, 1886. Special with Lorna for Best Brace of Irish Setters, St. Louis, 1886. Special for One of Best Kennel, Boston, 1886. Special for One of Best Kennel, Hartford, 1886. The most successful sires of the past and present are, about in the order named, Champion Elko, Plunkett, Rufus, the Great Glencoe, Berkeley, Aaron, Elko, Junior, Biz, Champion Norwood, Max Wenzel's Chief, Rory O'More, and Stoddard's Bob. The list of winnings these dogs and their descendants have to their credit would fill a book. It might be profitable to some of the breeders and would-be breeders of the present day to carefully study and consider the breeding of some of these dogs. For in this breed, as in all others, there is wisdom in choosing from good families, and in the light of the past it should not be difficult to pick out the successful dogs. We come now to consider the Irish Setter as a field dog. The cardinal points on which depend the value of every pointing dog are the same in all breeds, and I cannot do better than to quote from one of England's highest authorities, It's Stone, who speaks of the Irish setter as follows, quote, They have been jealously protected from mongrel outcrosses for many years by their native breeders, and they owe their popularity in Ireland and elsewhere to their quality quite as much as their color. They are exceedingly fast and very resolute, hardy, and thoroughly blood-like, genuine setters. A finer, more open-hearted, frank, good-tempered race no man can find. The thorough Irish dog is a very fast and persevering worker and a rapid galloper. An admirable water dog and invaluable in fens and swamps for snipe. In heather, his power and muscle enable him to do a long day's work without fatigue and he has a comparatively noiseless and stealthy gallop. He is inclined to be headstrong, and is accused of being hard to break. He demands patience, severity, and judgment. When, however, he settles down to his work and discovers the tactics of his owner, he is exceedingly valuable, and is regarded with envy by all who witness his mathematical precision, his firm style, his staunchness and patience, coupled with his docility, which is not excelled by any pointer or setter of any breed. End quote. My own experience and observation justifies me in asserting that, in natural adaptability, speed, range, endurance, pointing instinct, and bird sense, the red dog is not excelled by any race of setters in the world. Those I have seen were not more erratic, headstrong, or difficult to control than other dogs of high courage, and when properly trained and handled, they are as staunch and true on point and back as any pointer. Stoddard's friend was equally good on quail and snipe and was fond of hunting prairie chickens, and when retrieving one of those big birds, she was as proud of the capture as is the novice when he brings down his first bird. The assertion that the Irish setter is harder to break or train and keep in field form than other breeds of setters is not true of the Irish setter of today. I know from personal experience that a well-bred dog of this breed, properly brought up and trained, is the peer of any setter in the world. As companions, they are affectionate, gentle, and safe with children. I never saw a sour or ill-tempered dog of this breed in my life, and true to their masters. In the field, they are enthusiastic, fast, and tireless workers. One of the best setters of any breed I ever saw in the field is Mac N. This dog is as level-headed as any pointer, a keen hunter, a fast and wide ranger, quick and positive when among birds hunting with great judgment and discrimination, 
and heeding the slightest whistle or command. I have not seen Elko Jr. in the field, but am told by those who have that he is an out-and-out good one. Indeed, Dr. Jarvis has for years done his shooting over this dog, and to judge from his work at the Eastern Field Trials, where he ran in 1885, although not placed, he is able to hold his own with honor in any company. I know that no better snipe dog than Stoddard's Bob ever lived. But the red dog is lacking in no characteristic or faculty that is necessary in the makeup of the perfect field dog. The public trials have abundantly demonstrated. As before stated, Friend won first in 1878, defeating, among others, the well-known field trial winner Sanborn's Nellie. Joe Jr., a half-blooded son of Champion Elko, defeated the great and almost invincible English setter Champion Gladstone every time they met, both in public trials and in a two-days private match. Then Champion Biz defeated Count Noble. In 1879, Raleigh won second in the Eastern Field Trials Club All-Aged Stake. An Irish setter won the Members' Cup of the Eastern Field Trials in 1881 and 1884. That more Irish setters are not run in the field trials is not because of any inherent fault in the breed, nor has the breed deteriorated, as the field trials have demonstrated. For wherever an Irish setter competed in a public trial, he made it exceedingly interesting for all competitors. Reverend O'Callaghan's Aveline is a good illustration of the capabilities of the Red Dog of today, as is also Drohida, winner of second in the national trials at Shrewsbury. B.F. Seitner, Dayton, Ohio. End of section 